Good afternoon. On behalf of the NADTC, the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center, I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Impact of COVID-19 on Transportation Services for Older Adults and People with Disabilities, a conversation with Section 5310 programs. My name is Melissa Gray, and I'm the Senior Program Manager for the NADTC. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to highlight a few lo uh, webinar logistics. Uh, just to let everyone know that the webinar is being recorded and the uh, webinar recording and presentation slides will be sent to all web webinar registrants um, following the webinar. Uh, to ask a question, uh, we ask that you would type that into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we do recommend that you connect to your computer audio. Um, that would probably be the best source of sound for you today. Um, so again, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar and turn things over to Virginia Dyes. Um, she is the co-director of the National Aging and Disability Transportation, and she will be serving as our moderator for today. Uh, thank you. Welcome, <clears throat> welcome everybody. We're very excited to have you join this conversation on the impact of COVID-19 on transportation for older adults and people with disabilities. Um, as you know, NADTC is a partnership between N4A, the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, which is where I work, and Melissa works, and uh, Easter Seals. And we are funded by the Federal Transit Administration. NADTC's mission, which is to work with communities to increase the availability and accessibility of transportation, includes a focus on the Section 5310 program which is what we're gonna be focusing on today. Before we get started, I also wanna acknowledge with thanks my colleagues, Melissa Gray and Heather Edmonds who helped to organize this webinar. So we're gonna start right in. As you can see from the agenda, we're gonna do polling questions. We'll have presentations by our panelists. We'll have discussion and Q&A and lots of opportunities, hopefully, for you to get your questions answered. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce the poll. We've got two poll questions that we'd like for folks to respond to um, right here at the beginning. So Melissa, could you bring those up? Okay, the first, for, first poll question is, um, are you now receiving Section 5310 funding? That's a simple yes and no answer. So we'll ask you to respond to that pretty quickly. And we're going to give you a few minutes to respond uh, to both questions because we're not going to report the results of the poll for a few minutes. Um, the second question, let's see, you want to bring that, that one up? is uh, who is it that your program serves? Do you serve older adults? Do you serve people with disabilities? Or do you serve both of those population groups? I'm gonna leave that, that poll question up for a minute. Uh, while I talk about very briefly um, why we're doing this call, um, in the last few weeks, as I'm sure many of you um, who are listening to me, uh, we've talked with a number of transportation programs that serve older adults and people with disabilities, and also participated in a number of webinars on transportation where transportation providers have been talking about their experiences with COVID-19. Now, we think the Section 5310 programs with their focus on older people and people with disabilities are facing some of the same issues other transportation providers are facing. However, we think that uh, there are some unique challenges that are particularly related to serving older adults and people with disabilities, which as everyone knows, are at high risk of developing COVID-19 and being very sick and possibly dying from COVID-19. So today we'll be talking about some of those unique challenges, as well as the way in which three programs that receive 5310 funding have responded to those challenges. We're all, we know, uh, dealing with a time of profound change. 
And before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge with thanks a colleague from many years ago, Katie Heatley, from Outreach and Escort in Santa Clara, California. Um, Katie first, uh, early in the COVID crisis, she contacted us, um, and we were, of course, very glad to hear from her, with some questions that we found it hard to answer, um, and some information about how COVID-19 was impacting her program. Uh, I'm happy to say that Katie is currently recovering from co coronavirus. Um, so she's a participant instead of a panelist, because of course I, I turned the tables on her and said, would you be a panelist? Um, and she was unable uh, to commit to that at this point. So we wish you well, Katie, speedy recovery. Um, and to all of those who have been personally touched by this horrible pandemic, uh, please stay safe. So our speakers, we have three speakers today. Laura Bristow, who is the Executive Director of Action in Maturity in Baltimore, Maryland. Kathleen Cortez, um, who's a Transportation Manager with the Sonoma County Area Agency on Aging in Santa Rosa, California. And finally, but certainly not least, Nancy Welch, who's a pr the Program Manager of the Volunteer Assisted Transportation Program in Knoxville, Knox County. Uh, she works for the Community Action Committee there in Tennessee. So we've asked each of our panelists to talk a little bit about their program. Uh, so they're gonna tell us what they do and how they use 5310 funding to support their efforts to serve older adults and people with disabilities. And then each of them is gonna spend a few minutes talking about the impact of COVID-19 on their programs touching on changes in demand, the way services are now provided, and new roles and partnerships in which they are engaged. But before they do, um, I've asked uh, Melissa to share with us the results of our very quick polls. So Melissa, could you bring up the results? So the first question about receiving 5310 funding indicates that 68% of the participants today um, who responded to the poll um, are receiving that funding and 32% do not. Um, and response to the second question, Melissa, about who is being served. So we've got a real mix, but it looks like the vast majority of folks on the call are serving both older adults and people with disabilities, with 12% serving people with disabilities only um, and 9% serving older adults. Um, so with that, um, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions to use, to please use the Q&A box um, on your screen. We'll handle all the questions after everyone has had a chance to present. Um, and we're going to begin with Kathleen Cortez. So Kathleen. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and do a brief presentation of our program. So we are the Area Agency on Aging. I'm in Sonoma County, California. Just to give you a graphic of where we are, we're in Northern California. We are considered part of the San Francisco Bay Area and our geography is about 1,768 square miles. Our population is about 500,000 and of that 27% are of the age 60 and over. Our major um, predictors of the age breakdown are the 60 to 69 age group, which represent more than 50% of our older adults. For those older adults, 27% have at least one or more disabilities. And we have um, our population for projection for the year 2030 is about 33% of those age um, 60 and over. Looking at our transportation program, we are funded by the 5310 program, as well as we get funds from the Older Americans Act um, and the California Department of Aging. Our transportation program is a little bit unique in that um, 
The Area Agency on Aging does not operate the driver programs. We operate an information website and an information and assistance line, and we contract with service providers to provide the volunteer driver programs. Looking at our volunteer driver programs, we have uh, six volunteer driver programs. They each have a distinct geographic area and they are each operated by a different provider. Five of them are nonprofit organizations and one is the city of Healdsburg. We also have a shuttle program that operates in our rural area of the Western Sonoma County. And that uh, program is funded through our 5310 rural program. We get funds from both the urban and the rural um, 5310 for those that are familiar with the 5310 program. So the shuttle takes people from the rural areas into the urban area of Santa Rosa for shopping and medical appointments, as well as servicing their local area for shopping and um, community clinics. Our next, um, so looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on our programs, there have been many. We have all our, we are still closed. Our county is slowly opening up. California is um, a little bit different than some of the other states and we're in what's called phase two. So our senior centers and our offices are still closed. Um, the majority of our programs have transitioned to um, doing delivery services and not providing transportation to our seniors and disabled populations. We have um, most of them providing Meals on Wheels. Uh, we also have them working with our local food bank to deliver food boxes. We have a program called Sonoma Family Meal that's providing restaurant meals in our West County in our rural using the shuttle. And then we also have some programs that are doing pharmacy delivery, delivering medications and incontinent supplies, as well as doing grocery delivery. We have continued to offer urgent medical appointments using our 5310 transportation vouchers, mostly for those um, needing dialysis and um, continuing cancer treatments. We also have a few of our volunteers that have been continually willing to drive and some of our staff have also been driving our impacted seniors. Other impacts of the COVID-19 is most of our volunteer drivers are seniors, so they have been sheltering in place, which has required our programs to recruit new volunteers for the uptick in the growth in our meal deliveries, as well as the geographic um, the number of miles traveled has increased. We have also resorted to doing um, telephone calls. Most of our programs are calling their isolated seniors and disabled adults as they shelter in place, checking on those who we would normally drive around to make sure that they are getting their needs met as best as we can. We've also transitioned to Zoom and that's been um, difficult for some and fun for others. <laughs> um, we do have issues in our county with broadband. There are, there are places that are remote um, that do not have great internet or Wi-Fi access. And we've also been dealing with um, our population that may not um, be adverse to um, technology. They may not have iPhones and computers or not be able to use them um, in the way that they may need to. And above it all, we've had the heightened anxiety and the increased needs um, as this emergency continues. So what are we doing? We are getting ready to open up. And with that, we have implemented some safety protocols we have to communicate to our drivers and riders these new protocols. We will be screening the drivers and riders with questionnaires, and some of our providers are going to be doing temperature screening. We are going to be requiring PP&E for both our riders and our drivers. We have added cleaning protocols for the vehicles, ensuring adequate space in the vehicle, 
and when in doubt, referring out, um, using our transportation vouchers to use Uber or taxi or what's available in each geographic area or paratransit when that is available. Getting ready, are you ready? Well, we have seven different operators and we are looking at how are we going to best um, get everybody ready. So we have had an uptick in requests for rides. Um, so we're preparing that we may not be able to meet the demand. We will start with essential trips only, prioritizing the medical appointments. Um, our drivers are going to need to determine what's the best space in their vehicle, looking at the six feet requirement, um, how many pe people per vehicle should be allowed. Um, we need new protocols for assisting the blind and the mobility impaired. Some of our paratransit programs have a hands-off policy, um, so we need to be able to communicate what our policy will be. We are also looking at um, how are we going to handle requests for people that come out as COVID positive. Um, are we going to allow our drivers to take them? Or are we going to refer them out? How should that work? Um, we want consistency from all our drivers, no exceptions. We know our drivers are wonderful people and they like to go above and beyond, but we need to make sure that we keep safety in mind and regularly communicate with both the drivers and riders. We want to know, you know, what do we want them to know and what do we want them to comply with? That's at the forefront of our communication. And then lastly, um, we need to be able to balance our um, driving around our clients now when we open up as opposed to making deliveries. So at some point that's going to become something new. And then planning ahead, looking at our future here in Sonoma County, we have um, a lot of things to keep in consideration. We have added tasks on our staff and drivers. We have an increased cost for our PP&E. We're having an increased request for rides. Uh, we're going to need to prioritize them with the resources that we have and coming out slowly. At the same time, we need to look at volunteer recruitment and agency coordination. Um, we have to have look at our, our protocol for when there is an uptick. Right now in our county, we do have an uptick. We've had, um, I believe, 200 new cases in the last 14 days. So that is at the same time that we are starting to open up our offices. The County of Sonoma, uh, we plan to open our offices the first week in June, so we want to be ready. And we also are looking at budget cuts. We have across the board budget cuts um, for our city, county, state, and most of our agencies that operate our volunteer driver programs. We also have our 5310 cycle ending and a new cycle beginning. Our new cycle, we have decreased funding. So only 25% of our program that we've been operating is funded through 5310. So we're looking at having to gain resources from diminishing budgets. At that point, we're gonna need to evaluate our whether we need to reduce hours and services and then here in, in Northern California, we have fire season that's upon us. We have power shutoffs that happen during that time, um, evacuations, and at the same time, we need to keep in mind this new day of COVID-19. So we're gonna continue to evaluate how that impacts our services. So the new way, we all hear about the new normal, and for us here, it's emergency preparedness. It's not going to, away, to go away, so we're planning for it to stay. That's my motto. And we have an, numerous events that we have gone through here, so it's helped us in some respects in that we have had at the ready PP&E. We've, most of our, our providers and um, many of our population have been had to shelter in place or evacuate. So we've had our N95 masks and um, our gloves and we've been at the ready. So I would just recommend to people to um, talk with your clients and drivers, make sure your emergency contacts are updated, make sure they have communication and evacuate, evacuation plans if needed and have ready kits ready for your drivers. 
with gloves, sanitizer, masks, and wipes if possible. So with that, I would just say that we've been through this before as far as emergencies, we will rise above. And I want to thank all of our providers, our transit operators, our staff and volunteers who's go, gone above and beyond. And I'll be happy to take your questions at the end or um, I believe Melissa and Virginia have my contact information if someone would like um, a copy of the presentation. Thank you. I think you're muted. Virginia, you're on mute. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. We appreciate your presentation and we're gonna move right ahead um, and to Laura. Um, and Laura, I'm just gonna turn it over to you. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? I know you can't see me. Can't you can see how tired I look. Okay, um, so hi everyone. Thanks for um, uh, letting me join the panel. Um, my organization is, we're not a transportation organization per se. We call ourselves uh, a senior center without walls. Um, we're located in Baltimore, Maryland, and we serve Baltimore City seniors. We're a membership organization. Um, we have about 700 uh, members. Uh, they pay $15 a year. Um, to um, gain access to our shuttles. We take them to the grocery store and retail destinations. We have um, six 14-seat va vans and two um, uh, four-door sedans. Uh, the sedans take individuals uh, mostly to the doctor. And um, the vans take, well, back in, back in the day, pre-COVID, the vans, we did regular grocery shuttles, getting folks out of food deserts and to, to the grocery store and to Walmart. Um, and also uh, always offered every month a uh, full schedule of trips to places like the casino, museums, restaurants, um, all of which are uh, Hershey Park, all of which, of course, in COVID times are not, um, are, don't have open doors. Um, and so um, we have a, a several partners that we have MOUs with, um, like Catholic Charities, for example. We go around to their senior residences and take their folks to the grocery store. And when the COVID uh, curtain sort of fell on us, um, one by one, these partners said, "Look, we, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to put our old, um, our seniors at risk." Um, and so we'll we'll figure out how to get them food. And I'm still they're, you know. I have to say I don't know how food is getting to some of the folks we used to take to the grocery store. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, Maryland Food Bank, very involved, and Meals on Wheels, very involved. So here we were with our, our, um, our Mother's Day luncheon in May that we can't have and our trips that we can't go on, and for a, a minute we thought we're going to have to completely suspend our operations and just um, sh you know, shelve everything we were going to do and lay off everybody and wait for this thing to pass. But one of our partners um, happens to be a nursing home where we actually rent space, and we do drive um, clients of theirs to the back and forth of the adult day program, and they said to us, listen, the buses in Baltimore are not running like they used to, and many of our employees can't get to work. Can you take them to work? Uh, we'll pay you, and we said yes. So instead of being a senior center without walls, we're sort of the Keswick Multicare employee shuttle service. Um, we drive over 50 employees to work seven days a week, every shift, uh, every shift available, 7 a.m., 3 p.m., 11 p.m., um, and that's how we're um, getting it done. Um, that's how we're staying alive. Um, meanwhile, Baltimore and the Baltimore Health Department is super, super connected um, where all the agencies kind of know each other. Um, we're sort of a big, small town over here. And um, working with the health department and other organizations, we have also been transporting a lot of food to a lot of places, um, which has been really cool. And now we've just started transporting masks. Um, to places that need it, um, the senior residences or even the Baltimore Circulator so they can give masks to folks who are getting on their buses 
I don't think that's happening yet. Not much is Baltimore is still pretty much closed. Baltimore City, um, slowly, slowly opening. Um, we get 5310 funding and Office on Aging funding, um, and then uh, the private foundation also um, funding us. Uh, so, instead of being completely on hold, we feel that we're relevant. We're adding value. Um, the employees come on our buses. We take um, five or six at a time so that they can be socially distanced. Uh, drivers are in masks and gloves. They have cleaning supplies to clean off the van every time a group disembarks. Um, and um, we are running small grocery shuttles, our usual neighborhood grocery shuttles, um, a couple of times a week. And also, if there's more than five or six people, we take the first five or six. We don't want to load people up on the van. Um, and the people getting on our van also wear masks. So, um, so yeah, that's so we're looking we're looking forward to a time when we kind of go back to new normal. We worry a lot about our seniors and their health. Um, we think there's going to be a lot of trepidation getting back on the vans when things first start. But let me tell you, the casino is a very popular destination. And the Baltimore casinos have a lot of pub public relations uh, marketing stuff out there showing how how they're trying to mitigate and socially distance when, when, they're, when their customers come back. So, so that's our story. Well, thank you, Laura. Really appreciate it. Uh, mm -hmm. clearly, clearly, you are in a different place than um, Kathleen is uh, because right. of the difference in you know, what's open, what's not open, et cetera. Um, so with that, we're going to move right ahead. Um, and uh, Nancy, you're up. Hi, I'm Nancy Welch. I'm with Volunteer Assisted Transportation. We're a volunteer program, um, volunteer driven nonprofit here. Um, we take seniors and people with disabilities to medical appointments, shopping, errands, and we're assisted transportation. So we've seen some changes. They actually marked us as non-essential in the beginning that they sent us home for a week and a half and no more trips. So I didn't quite understand that, but um, it kept everybody home and shelter in place and stay at home. Um, so we slowly started coming back into the office only because we know that the elderly and the aging need to get grocery, um, the grocery items, get to the grocery store. So we started calling our volunteers and seeing who could help make sure that maybe they could go shopping for someone. So we've been shopping for individuals. We're going getting their money and their list and going, and shopping and dropping that off at their front porch or handing it off to them and then making sure they get to doctor's appointments if it was an essential appointment. So May 4th, we started doing more essential appointments because the doctor's offices were starting to open up more um, and taking those medical appointments or those dental appointments. Um, as of today, we started taking non-essential appointments like people need to get to go get their nails done or their hair done and um, we had put that off as long as we could, but we started uh, incorporating that today as they call. Um, as far as our vehicles, we are using our minivans. Um, we have minivans and we also have sedans, which are Toyota Priuses or Ford Fusions. We were using only our minivans so that we could promote the social distancing. They could sit in the back seat. Um, and there was enough distance between the driver. We're also requiring that the drivers and the passengers wear a mask, um, and, but we're not doing any kind of testing or anything like that. We are asking screening questions, you know, have you been exposed or how do you feel? Have you been sick? And most of them have just been staying in place and they're not sick, thank God. So I've um, been very fortunate that we don't know anybody that's had it. So that's how we're helping and still continuing some of my volunteers are very apprehensive about coming back to volunteer so with that being said my volunteers are limited to provide the trips that we are taking on now so hopefully by mid-june some of those will be coming back but we're not sure <laughs> how that will look locally we're in phase two as well our senior centers are closed um, so we're not taking anybody to those and not meeting in large groups. However, we've got people wanting to go to where they need to go or they wanna go shopping for themselves. Uh, and we try to encourage them, we can shop for you. Some appreciate that and some really wanna get out if they possibly can. Um, we haven't taken on any new roles because we 
just for, other than the shopping for, because normally we're not an errand service. Normally we're helping the individual, staying with them and providing one-on-one -on -one assistance. So the probably the, new, the only new role we took on was shopping for the individual. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Um, okay, we're, we're now going to uh, move to Q&A. Uh, and um, so if you, if we don't get to your questions, just know that we will be following up and ensuring that all the questions that come in will be answered. Um, and we're going to just go in order. Um, so the first question is, um, how do you handle a customer that does not want the car filled with chemical cleaning solutions? So I'll open that up to anyone who wants to weigh in. We have not had complaints uh, about that um, from our folks. Um, the, uh, I don't know if that we're using I, I don't know why the cars smell clean to me, but I wouldn't say they smell chemically. Um, Kathleen or Nancy, anything to add? We to have that? not had any complaints as well, and I do apologize if there's background music, uh, music background noise. They're doing construction upstairs. Um, you can smell that there's a cleaning solution that has like a bleach uh, derivative, but we've had no one complain. But uh, my suggestion would be that you're doing it to protect the individual and all the individuals that you're serving. Uh, if, you know, it's something that maybe they don't want to be around or they can't smell or whatever, maybe their situation because of their immune system, you would hate to lose that person, but maybe suggest a different um, transportation option, but it is for their protection. Okay. Just to add that as a disclosure, um, when people call for a ride that maybe they, if, if we, if someone could ask if they do have issues with that, that it could be a problem for them. Okay. Um, our next question is from the director of the small senior center who uh, apparently operates a 14 passenger bus. Um, she said that, or he said, they're not open right now, um, but what are the recommendations at this time for public transit, or I guess reopening? And I think some of that, um, certainly, um, I think all three of you touched on reopening and some of the challenges and issues, but I don't know if you have any particular advice uh, to share. I can just say that in um, Sonoma County, we have three different paratransit operators. Um, I know that one of our paratransit operators is only um, taking one person per vehicle. So it's essential trips only, uh, one person per vehicle for their paratransit. Nancy or Laura? Anything our paratransit locally, which is Knox County CAC, we're in the same building um, and we get to converse quite often about what's going on and the upcoming changes. They were only limiting four people to a paratransit bus and they were also every other seat. So for the social distancing and requiring masks. So I, it just depends on your agency, but I would promote the social distancing and mask and all the other PPE and the precautions. And Laura, anything to add? Well, I don't really consider us public transit per se, so I, I, um, I'm not, I don't know that I can speak to it, um, really. Um, we have 14 passenger buses, and um, we distance people on them and, um, you know, require masks and all that. But our public transit is really, really limited uh, at this time in Baltimore, just essential only. Okay. Um, so our next question is a question about thermometers. And the question has three parts, so I'll give it all to you at once. So how are thermometers being used? Um, are they being used by drivers um, or for pre-boarding um, by service providers? I can 
can speak to, to one of our volunteer driver programs is operated by uh, the city of Healdsburg and the city provides the vehicles for the volunteers to drive. So the volunteer, the drivers need to come to the senior center to pick up the vehicle. And at that time, um, they are using thermometers to screen the drivers. Um, we all have our temperatures taken um, at this uh, nursing home location every morning um, uh, and uh, answer questions about where we've been and whether we are symptomatic, um, just as sort of a screen. Um, but we, don't, um, we do not interact with our riders like that in any way. And Nancy, are you using them at all? At this time, we are not using thermometers and we're doing any, just pre-screening questions is all that we're asking. Okay. And is that the same with the paratransit service that the CAC operates? Yes. And we're, we're not even, as far as I know, I know in our departments, we're not being screened when we come in. So uh, as far as the other employees in our community action committee, um, I'm not sure if they've started that at all. Okay. Thank you. Um, so our next question, and I think it might be directed to you, Kathleen, but anyone else can weigh in on it. Um, it's, can you talk more about who will be deciding how many passengers per vehicle and the spacing of passengers or any other thoughts you might have on maintaining social distancing on vehicles? You know, we have the six feet social distancing requirement. So since the AAA, the Area Agency on Aging is not a provider of transportation, it's up to each of our operators to decide um, to look at most of um, our providers that are, have been providing rides, it's one person per vehicle. So if that's something you need to look at the size of the vehicle, whether it's a van or a compact car, something to take in consideration if a person needs a caregiver to go with, then that's um, what you wanna take into consideration when you match your riders with drivers. Okay. Anyone else wanna weigh in on that? Um, I'll just say for when we're, we've just begun uh, taking folks to the grocery store again and typically they are residents of a residents of a senior center so we um, talk to the service coordinator first to say if we're going to start this just know that we can't take 14 people at a time we can send two buses and do you know six people and six people kind of thing but we're not going to crowd people on the bus and everybody has been super understanding about this and you know um i think there's uh, you know there's they understand that you know we're all trying to protect everybody okay um next question um is can you explain the quote no touch end quote policy that some agencies have um is this even possible for people who are uh, sight impaired and those with uh, mobility devices you know, can any of you all speak to that issue You came up in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have a regional mobility management group that meets and um, I know that one of the Bay Area providers, I can't recall which one it was, um, has addressed um, the needs for blind and mobility impaired and they have taken on that they will not be assisting. So if, they're, if somebody needs hands-on assistance, then they're gonna have to find another provider that does it because they basically have a hands-off policy. I know other transit providers have said that their drivers have shields and gloves. So if they do need to help somebody with a wheelchair, um, they have provided the PP&E for that. Anyone want to weigh in on that? Okay. Um, so our next question is, um, how do you coordinate employee pickup? Do you use a specific software? Are people grouped together according to work start time and pickup location? Um, I'm guessing this is for us since we're the yes, I think up employees. So, so, um, so um, the answer is no, we don't have specific software. Um, and the way we coordinate it is extremely manually. My transportation coordinator works with somebody at Keswick 
who's got everybody's schedule and shifts. And, um, yes, we try to group people together according to their start time and pick up locations so that one driver is going to, you know, one or two zip codes. We were hoping that we could just get folks to go to whatever their bus stop normally is, um, and that has not worked out. So it has been a very labor-intensive um, activity. And um, for whatever reason, sometimes someone will work a 7 to 3 shift in job A on Monday, and then they'll be working a 3 to 11 in some other job on Tuesday, same person. And so every day is different, um, and we can't, we can't get it quite down to a science, and we don't want to put more than uh, a few people on a bus at a time. Um, so uh, the, whole, the whole fleet is out there doing its thing. Um, software would be great, but I don't even know if software would help us with so many variables. Anyone else picking up employees at all? I don't think I heard anyone else mention it. Okay, um, Melissa, I need your help because my um, screen is frozen and that's the last question I can see. Okay, let's see. Thank you, you could move it. It was, the questions were um, moving, but now they're not. So could okay. you read the next question? What was the last question addressed? I was uh, from, uh, how do you uh, coordinate employee pickup? Okay, great. No problem. All right, so this next question is for Laura. Um, are your vehicles purchased with 5310 funding? If so, have you verified with the FTA that you can use them to transport workers instead of seniors and persons with disabilities? This is undoubtedly a critical service, but I worry about your funding, you running afoul of their requirements. Yeah, thank you for what a great question, and thank you for your worry. Um, we did discuss this with our um, MTA uh, um, contact, and she did not seem to think it was a problem. Um, we know it's temporary. We also know we're getting people to seniors and folks with disabilities, um, and so um, we feel on pretty solid ground. But um, it's certainly worth my checking back with her one more time. But we know that um, things, uh, things in Maryland and Baltimore seem slated to open in the next 30 days, and we'll be back to our normal. Great. Uh, next question for any of the panelists. How do you handle the money piece when shopping for others? I will answer that for uh, This has actually been, we've learned from our experiences. Um, they can either give us a debit card um, or we've had food stamp cards um, or even a check. Um, we've learned the challenges. I told them to ask questions, be specific, get the numbers and all the stuff that you need because it can be a challenge to get to the store and have the wrong number or transpose the numbers. But seeming that we, we screen our volunteers, so with that reassures our driver, I mean, our riders, uh, our clients that, hey, you can trust them by giving them this information. So they're going to go to the store, they're going to get what you need, um, but making sure that they keep that to them and they keep it confidential and they don't share it with anybody. Okay. Um, so I guess on that, in that uh, same vein, uh, Laura, there's a question directly to you about uh, deciding who to take on grocery trips during COVID. Um, we, you know, we say to our, um, as I said, we say to a service provider, we try to get a list ahead so we know how many, so we know how many buses to send. But um, uh, we just say first come, first serve, whoever the first six people, you know, in line are. Um, and as I said, we have a service coordinator usually on the other end um, kind of running interference on that. So we're not making some kind of decision. You get food, you don't get food. All right. Uh, next question, have, have any of the drivers expressed concern about wearing the mask while driving, for instance, do they cause distraction, foggy lenses, things like that? Not mine. I have not had any concern. And we can provide a face shield. I think that would be more distracting than a mask. Uh, along those lines about PPE, uh, another question, does any, do, do any of you all have documentation on what uh, is appropriate PPE? We are providing N95 masks for our drivers and then providing a like medical mask for a, um, 
a rider if they don't have one, but they must provide their own. We're not providing 300 or more masks. They have to provide their own. But if they haven't been out of the house and they need a mask, we'll provide them one. But we are providing the N95 for our drivers. Okay, Any, anyone else want to address that? I'm curious about what you mean by documentation. Like is there, we, we, we go by what the CDC is recommending. That's our documentation. Great, thank you. Uh, can any of you all speak to how rural areas or providers are navigating this situation? Three ten does have a rural component to it, where we have a shuttle, uh, an agency that has a shuttle. Would they would normally take people into the city for shopping? Um, however, since we've been sheltering in place, that um, agency has now. Um, been able to deliver restaurant meals for our rural um, seniors and people um, that are disabled in their community. So they've partnered with an, an agency called Sonoma Family Meal um, with uh, funds that we've gotten from um, for emergency COVID funding. And um, it's a great partnership. It's, it's a pilot project for our rural um, Western County only. Um, okay, um, I'm, my screen seems to be moving, uh, Melissa, so right, in, you, in response to the question you just sent me, so um, I'll, I'll take over for now. And All right, I, sounds great. If I need your help, I'll holler. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is a question for Nancy. Um, and have there been changes in the way in which your drivers are providing assistance since Basically, the volunteer assisted program I know provides rides for people who actually need assistance, either hands on assistance or some other kind of mechanical help. We are providing gloves and the mask, um, trying to promote the six foot distance, but actually, if you're providing the one on one assistance to an elderly person, you have to help them. So. Um, encourage them to wash their hands, use hand sanitizer if they have to touch the individual. And a lot of places here locally, if you're taking them to a medical office, they're not letting us walk in with the individual. You get them in the door and they tell you to stay in the vehicle. They're not letting people just sit in the waiting rooms and wait around. They um, are monitoring that and making, making people wait outside. So if we have to help someone, we will because that's what we're there for because the, a lot of these elderly people don't have individuals to help them and stay with them. So we got to push a wheelchair in or hold their arm to make sure they don't fall or trip. So um, we are helping them and then just encourage them to wash their hands, um, hand, san hand sanitizers, uh, put gloves on and change their gloves. Um, are you, and this is a general question, are you able to refuse service to riders who will not wear a mask? Um, is there a funding restriction that prohibits refusing service to riders who don't wear masks? I've not had, myself personally, have not had to deny service for that because all of them have been pretty understanding that, hey, I will wear a mask. I do have a mask and this is to protect me. So no one's ever refused that, but we were told if someone did, we would have to refuse service if they refused to wear a mask because it's to protect everyone around us. And again, that's coming down from the CDC guidelines. Hey, we want you to wear a mask and it's to protect everyone. Anyone have experience with that that they want to share? No, lots of compliance for us. And I see Kathleen nodding her head as well. Yes. <laughs> um, so there are, next question is, there are organic cleaners out there that have less chemicals or natural cleaning agents. That's not a question, obviously. That's a comment for, I guess it relates to the question that we had about people who might refuse to ride um, because of the chemicals that have been used to sanitize the vehicle. So Nancy, another question for you. Um, no, I'm mess messing up. That's the one about hands-on assistance. So next question. Um, 
Well, we, we've already gotten the question about how did you handle money. So for Laura, why didn't folks want to go to the bus stop? Where did you pick them up instead? And how close to the preferred pickup time could you manage? Um, we picked them up from their homes, if you can believe it. Um, why? I, I can't remember why the bus stop idea ended up not working. Um, but it just, it just didn't make as much sense as going to their homes. Um, I, I think, I, just, I honestly, I can't recall. Now, uh, I, time, time has no meaning. We've been doing this for like a month and a half. Um, but the, ho the pickup from home seems to be the best, has been, has been more efficient than anything for us. Crazy. Um, I, so next question. Um, how do you seek clients on vehicles such as a minivan, a 13 passenger van or a bus? How does that work? I, I think the question probably is about social distancing. So how do you assure social distancing on the vehicles? Uh, ours are um, every other seat and uh, on e staggered on e there's um, two seats on each side of the aisle and so there's one person uh, there's one person instead of two people and then they're staggered so a person and then not somebody directly behind them on the other aisle but staggered so someone is on the window side of aisle one and then in aisle two they're on the um, aisle side do you know what I mean and then on the window side and the aisle side any anyone else in our minivans, we're sitting them in the very back seat, and it is just we just transport one person as a, at a time. And as we are phasing in our sedans, if they're they will be requested to sit in the back seat, and they will sit on the opposite side as well, not behind the driver. They will sit in the back seat behind the passenger seat. Okay. Yeah, I, I do those two two as well. Okay. The next question is. How did you recruit more volunteers? And I'm not sure, is that directed to you, Kathleen? Did you, did your, any of your programs recruit additional volunteers? Yeah, with our um, programs, when our senior centers um, sh had to shut their doors and our drivers um, were no longer driving, most of our um, employers had also um, either laid off people or people were at home and there was um, people wanting to volunteer and wanting to help. There were also partnerships with our local food bank um, where people were available to help with the, the food deliveries. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Um, Nancy, I think you said that some of your volunteers um, are not currently uh, giving rides. Have you all thought about recruiting new volunteers? Um, I kind of put that on hold as well, but we're coming up with June right around the corner. I think we're going to be recruiting more and trying to get more people involved because to be honest, some of these um, individuals are older. They're seniors as well. So th the reality is, is they may not come back. Um, just depending on the situation of COVID-19. So we have to be realistic and start recruiting more heavily. Okay. Um, the next question is a little um, long, so I'm going to read it word for word so I don't get anything wrong. So if any of the um, presenters um, has transitioned from transportation to delivery services, are there plans to continue to provide delivery services on a limited basis um, after limited transportation services resume. Um, and the, the question is asked by Daniel Roberts, who says that her organization has done this and she's concerned about our constituents getting used to this service and struggling when we start trying to go back to quote unquote normal. So whoever wants to take that. Um, I'll, I'll start. What a great question, because um, we're doing a lot more delivery, food delivery, than we've ever done before. Um, and we're not um, part of anybody's grant to do it. We're just kind of using operational funding uh, to do it. Um, uh, but I, I, don't think, I don't think it will need to continue, because we're doing it for people who can't get out, won't get out um, during COVID, as they feel more confident ab about their you know, resuming their normal life, they won't need 
these delivery services. Um, ours are not necessarily for people who have lost their jobs and can't afford food. They're more for seniors who are at risk, you know, more at risk, more vulnerable if they go out. Um, but we love partnering, and we've, you know, we've connected with lots of interesting organizations. Um, and so we're, and we're, you know, t for me, kind of with my strategic hat on, thinking, hmm, where's a funding opportunity, you know, to have a project or a program um, that can benefit people in that way. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? We are just, doing. Oh. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, we're doing it temporarily, depending on the individual. We might continue it because as COVID-19 goes on and we have a new normal, there's some people that may not, you know, want to get out and they prefer somebody going to get their um, items because the other day I asked a lady, I said, do you want to go? She said, I really don't want to go. So um, that may grow or it may decrease. It just depends on the need. So we'll just have to see what happens. Yeah, I would just add that it, it is a concern for our program since um, we've been doing a lot of deliveries, but um, our senior centers provide the congregate meals. People usually come to the senior center um, to have their meal and now they're having their meals delivered. So it's a matter of having the uh, programs, maybe the Meals on Wheels or other programs that usually do the nutrition taking over and it's going to be a balancing act, I believe, in the beginning and it's just going to have to be something to constantly evaluate how many drivers and what the priorities are and how that can be managed. Okay, we're, we're going to do one more question. Uh, we're, we're coming up on the hour and uh, I want to be w aware of everyone's time. Um, I will say that there are other questions in the queue and we'll be sure um, to address those. Um, and include those in the summary uh, document that we're going to be putting on our website. So this question has to do about with funding. Uh, it asks whether any of your organizations has had any funding issues at all. Um, and recognizing that the CARES Act provided funding for 5307 and 5311, but not 5310. Um, so, Anyone who wants to weigh in on this issue? We, uh, Kathleen, um, Kathleen, you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Nancy, did you start answering? Um, as far as funding goes, our 5310 program, we were already um, for the next grant cycle going into having less funding for our programs. So it was kind of on our radar. Um, the Area Agency on Aging um, is slighted to receive funding for CARES Act, but that money has not come. And uh, right now everything's kind of on hold with our governor and um, things, you know, changing sort of minute by minute with the funding and, and more funding cuts. So our 5310 program did not get any, any more funding and we are preparing to um, do more with less. We've been, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, um, we applied for a PPP, a PPP and um, received it, um, which has been great to keep us going um, uh, from a payroll perspective um, and um, have just because we're not a transportation organization in the same way my fellow colleagues are here um, we've been applying for grants from um, you know from uh, any funder that we think um, can can assist so we've been getting funny little um, buckets of money from places like a small Johns Hopkins fund, not the Johns Hopkins University or Medical Center from something called their Neighborhood Fund, and something from, the, of all things, the Fund for Educational Excellence, um, which had a, a, a health component uh, to, their, to, to what their RFPs could be. So um, we've been able to bring in some additional funding that we hadn't looked at before. And Nancy, did you have anything to add? No, we haven't had any funding issues. We've been very fortunate. Okay. Well, we're, we're about out of time. Boy, the hour just seemed to fly by to me. And we do have some outstanding questions, as I said. We'll do our best to get responses to your questions. 
um, and make sure that they're posted on our website, nadtc.org. Um, I want to offer the panelists the opportunity to say anything final that you want to add that, that you feel like you didn't have a chance to say. Don't feel obligated, but you can. Just thank you very much. Nice to meet everybody. Well, thank you. I will add my thanks um, definitely uh, to our presenters. I think they, they handled a lot of questions and provided some very valuable information. So we really appreciate their willingness um, to participate in this webinar. Um, as I said, we will respond to your questions. We're making a recording of today's webinar. It should be posted uh, shortly on our website. Um, look for it probably tomorrow or the day after at the latest. Um, we also will be sending out an evaluation uh, to all participants and we urge you please respond to that evaluation. Um, let us know what you thought, whether it worked for you, whether you feel like there are unanswered questions that you'd really like to pose. It's not too late to ask one. Um, and you can also let us know whether or not um, if we do another similar type of call, um, are there particular issues that you'd like us to make sure that we cover? Uh, because we think this is, a, this is a very important issue at this point in time. Um, we don't know what the future holds exactly. We know that it's gonna be different. And we know that like all of us on this call, um, the people that you serve, older adults and people with disabilities, are ready to get out. I think one of the things that we've learned is the profound effect that social isolation has on people. Um, even in the best of all circumstances, it can be really wearing and exhausting and emotionally draining. Um, and so we know that many people in our communities are dealing with that and dealt with it before COVID-19 and we'll deal with it after the communities open up. So transportation is so critical for helping people live full lives. And that's part of the mission that I think we all share. So thank you to our speakers and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.